All right. So um, yeah, let's get started. So thank thank you all for having me here today. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a PhD stu student at Stanford, and I'll be presenting some recent work on understanding and selecting data for training language models. So the problem we study starts with the observation that these large language models have um, numerous capabilities. And while there's a lot of key factors um, that contribute to these capabilities, you know, like um, architecture, training procedure, context length, parameter count, it's also often said that the amount and the quality of the training data is a crucial factor. Um, however, given a fixed training budget, it's quite challenging to reason about how to select data to bring to best bring about these capabilities since this data selection problem after all in its truest form is combinatorial. So some of the technical papers for recent language models or upcoming language models disclose this training data mixture. Um, so here I have like a pie chart for like the, the Dolma data set. So that's 78% common crawl, 14% stack and so on. And um, these technical papers will uh, um, sometimes explain how they come up with these mixtures. So they'll say, we want all these different sources because there's good data diversity and because we want our language model to do well on, say, code, we'll have some code data. So very intuitive things. Um, however, it's still not really well understood how these training data mixtures connect to these capabilities of these language models. And so we don't have clear ideas of how to select data beyond these very broad strokes of like diversity and, you know, common sense of if we show X data to the model, it will do well on X. So to dive into this question of how language models acquire these capabilities through training data, um, which we'll hope, we hope will help us understand how to select data. Um, let's take a step back and think about how humans learn. So there's a ton of literature coming from like spanning several decades on these like curricula. So the question there is how do we show a sequence of skills or concepts to students or humans so that they can best learn them? So like in the example here, we see that when teaching math, it's really reasonable to start with the basics. So you start with addition and then you build into more advanced concepts like multiplication, division, um, and so on. And so in particular, in the 1960s, several educational psychologists proposed this thing called a learning hierarchy where they found that uh, certain prerequisite skills were very influential for helping more advanced skills. So for this example here, addition is a key building block with subtraction, multiplication, and these other skills. And these researchers also found that when they changed the order in which these skills were learned, the students tended to retain these skills far less, suggesting that there's this uh, natural hierarchy of information that induces an order of skills that humans best learn in. So a potential hypothesis is that maybe models also learn like this and um, that there's this ordering over skills that it learns best from. And so I'll mention as a side note, what I'm saying here is not really anything new. This is just curriculum learning, which has been around for quite a while. Uh, but unfortunately, it, curriculum learning hasn't been quite widely adopted as the recommendation when using training data is just random shuffling or IID sampling is still like a very strong baseline. So to summarize what I'll be going over in this talk, the two key questions are first, like how does training data influence the various model capabilities? And can we use that understanding to better select training data? And so in our recent paper, we confirmed this hypothesis that there exist these concepts or groupings, which we call skills, that are associated with the data and there's this natural order in which the model learns these skills most efficiently. So we find that we can figure out what this order is and then exploit it for more effective data selection. So the outline of my talk is as follows. So first I'll be talking about verifying this hypothesis that there are these ordered skill sets that the language model learns best from. Um, to do this, we'll need to do a few things. We'll need to define what a skill is, define how to construct this ordering, and also show on data that this ordering is beneficial for the model. 
Um, next, I'll discuss our problem of data se selection for language models, uh, where we propose our algorithm called Skillet, um, which is an online sampling algorithm that exploits this ordering I just mentioned. And then finally, I will go over some empirical results and conclude with some discussion points. And feel free to ask any questions during the talk or after. So the first question is, what is a skill exactly? And so we'll start with a really operational definition. Um, so here we just say skills are these units of model behavior that have some associated data where you know, we train on the data pertaining to the skill and then the model's performance on the held out data from that skill improves. So this is like a super general definition. Uh, we just want to use it to capture any sort of like meaningful uh, grouping of data, um, such as like tasks, data sources, um, task categories, like other sorts of like metadata groupings. And then the next question is, do, does a set of skills have a particularly um, meaningful order to learn them in? And how do we construct this order? So I'll go into what I mean by meaningful. So to reason about these orders, let's actually just look at a case of two skills and how they influence each other. Um, so here we introduce the concept of this skills graph. And we say that there is an edge from SI to SJ in the skills graph. If the validation loss on SJ, when we train on a mixture of SI and SJ, is lower than if we just train on SJ, so over a fixed overall budget. So as shown in this, uh, this graph here is probably the best visualization of this. Um, some other ways of thinking about this are like, we have a set of training data associated with skill J, and we swap out half of that data with, with data from skill I and the model ends up doing the same or better on SJ. Um, and a final way to interpret this is, um, another way in words, is that the per point value of skill I for skill J is the same as or higher than the per point value of skill J for skill J itself. So now that we have established what this skills graph is, we need to note that not all skills graphs are going to give uh, meaningful orders to learn the skills in. So you can imagine that we have um, two skills that are completely unrelated somehow for the language model, and then the ordering of them won't really matter. You can like train half of them first one way and train the other half the other way. Um, on the other hand, if these two skills are almost identical or just kind of like IID sampled groupings, um, the order of learning them doesn't matter really either. And you could do like 80% of skill one and eight, 20% of skill two, and it would actually do the same thing because these skills are the same. So um, we define this ordered skill set as a set of skills whose corresponding skills graph is neither empty nor complete. So this kind of delineates this regime of skills graphs where there is like sufficient asymmetry across skills that can be utilized when training a model. So actually note that this doesn't necessarily have to be a DAG, but it just has to have some like general dagness to it. So we actually ended up constructing this definition because we found that there were real data sets and um, candidate sets of skills where the skills graph was complete or empty. So in this example here, we took the pile of law and we split it up according to different legal data sources. So like tax court rulings, um, US Bill of Rights, um, model, uh, not model, um, United Nations conversations. Um, and so when we tried learning the skills graph, we found that there were actually very few directed edges. So this adjacency matrix here is almost completely sparse. And this suggests that all the skills were roughly independent. And so in this case, if we want to learn everything, um, a very natural and probably like the best thing to do is just to you know, sample like one over K points per skill and just learn all of them equally. And we found that was like a really, that worked really well for this data set. Um, on the other hand, we took the Alpaca data set, which is a bunch of instruction data, and we split it into these skills according to the leading verb. So things like generate, add, revise. Um, the reason why we did this is this is like, there's like this pie chart that people do where they show, hey, look, this instruction data is really diverse. These are all the different verbs it uses. These are kind of the different uh, capabilities it's corresponding to. But um, we found that nearly all these skills had edges and it was a very, very um, dense graph. And in this case, if everything is 
influencing each other, then uh, random sampling is a very strong baseline. And we found that it was as good as these more complex skill aware or skill graph aware approaches. And then finally, for the natural instructions data set, we group this by task categories. So things like question answering, sentiment analysis, um, different concepts like that. And we found that the skills graph was neither too sparse nor too dense. And um, this suggests that there is a decent amount of asymmetry in how the model learns. And so basically, this all of this is to point out that um, there's this rather obvious notion of what semantically meaningful groups of data is to us. And while they do sometimes correspond to how the model learns these skills, this isn't always true. So the question of can we even show that there are these skills and this ordering that exists in the data um, is pretty interesting. So now let's go into more detail about showing that these ordered skill sets exist. So we'll first start with some synthetics. Here is um, what's called the Lego synthetic. So the inputs here consist of a sequence of these variable assignments, um, these recursive variable assignments to the value of zero or one. And so each variable is just a letter of the alphabet here. And the task is for the model to provide the value of one of these variables in the sequence. So in the first example, I'm asking the model what is B. Um, and so the model will have to look at R equals value one, uh, Y equals not R, and B equals not Y to finally say that, okay, B is equal to one. Um, for the second example, I'm asking the model what is K, and this is a lot easier. The model just has to look a few steps back and see K equals value zero. So um, we therefore define the skill X for the Lego synthetic as the model's ability to get the value of the X variable correct. So intuitively, this second example, skill one, is quite easy because all the model should need to do is just look at what the value is and just um, regurgitate that. Um, but subsequent skills are quite harder. So for skill three here, we imagine that you need to learn skill two. So it needs to get the second variable right. And that requires getting the first variable right. So a guess of what our skills graph looks like is this sort of chain behavior, like skill one is the easiest and then it gets harder as we go on. So we apply our definition of the skills graph and we show some of the edges we've learned below. So we do this by continually pre-training a 125 million parameter model on the Lego input output pairs. And we just measure the um, next token prediction loss on the output token um, on a validation data set. So here we can see that there's an edge from two to three in the leftmost diagram. So training on skills two and three helps with skill three more than skill three itself. And we see a similar behavior for an edge from skill two to four in the center. Um, however, the interesting thing is that we don't see an edge from skill three to skill four, um, even though intuitively we just said that um, we think the model should be learning skill three before skill four. But we can see on the right hand side that the, the validation loss for both of them is kind of the same. It's plateauing at 0.7 and not going down to zero at all. So these findings suggest that great, there is this ordered skill set, this little graph I have below, but it isn't what we exactly thought it was. So we have to be careful. So as another uh, synthetic example, we look at three digit addition. So in the input, we give um, two three digit numbers and we ask the model for the value of the addition out of specific digit. So in the first example here, we're asking for the ones digit, which is indexed by A1 equals question mark, and in the second example, we're asking for the hundreds digit, which is like this A3, the third index by three. And here we're going to denote skill X as the model's ability to get the X digit of addition correct. So again, we can imagine that skill one is, oh, skill one is very easy because um, there's no carrying and that's how we naturally solve addition. And these higher skills might be a bit more complex because they might need this um, carryover depending on what the previous digit was. So we're gonna guess that there's this sort of like chain behavior that I've drawn out here. So we show one of the edges that we've learned below. So we find that there's an edge going from skill two, which is the tens digit to 
skill one, which is the ones digit, um, since training on one and two helps with skill one more than just training on skill one. And so notice that this is quite different from what we were expecting, where we thought that skill one was going to help with skill two. But um, nonetheless, this is showing that there is this sort of um, ordered skill set behavior. So next, let's go over some results on real data. So in particular, we're looking at a few subsets of the natural instructions data set. So for our first subset, we're focusing on looking at Spanish question generation and a few related tasks. So English question answering, English question generation, and Spanish question answering. And the skills graph we learn over these four skills is on the left side here, where we find that this uh, English QA, Spanish QA, and English question generation are all um, these sorts of prerequisite skills for Spanish question generation as shown by these, uh, these edges all going to the fourth um, node here. And in the figure on the right, we see that when we train on these prerequisite skills along with Spanish question generation, we do better than when we just train on Spanish question generation, which is the blue line that's kind of plateauing here. Another subset we look at in the natural instructions data set is um, considering stance detection and text matching. So here are some examples of both, but basically stance detection is like, we want to see if an argument is in favor of a topic and text matching is here are two sentences. Are they arguing the same thing? So both task categories are kind of like um, requiring the model to reason about relationships between inputs. And we find that there's this edge from text matching to stance detection as shown in the figure here. So training on text matching along with stance detection is improving model performance on stance detection itself. So, um, so now we've kind of established that we can learn these skills graphs that show that these ordered skill sets do exist in real data. And one takeaway from these um, figures I've had here are that if you, these figures are basically saying that if you want your model to do well on some advanced skill, the solution isn't just to train on that skill itself, which is kind of counterintuitive to like, um, I guess like fine tuning wisdom, but to instead train on some prerequisite skills as well. And um, I guess this is a little bit different from these sorts of like auxiliary task learning, because those are also always like, we have an extra budget for um, training on extra data. But here it's like, we have a fixed overall budget so this, so this um, orange line is effectively like using half the actual task data that we want to do well on. So, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I no assume you don't do like a full epoch or something like that. You're not like repeating stance detection. Yeah, we're not repeating data. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is quite a powerful um, like condition to have, and this is going to allow us to better select training data to not only just learn um, one skill, but also a variety of different skills at once. Yeah, another yeah. question, how sensitive it is to like random saves and random shuffling of the data? Um, so this, these are all over, averaged over five random seeds. So we definitely see this uh, behavior. Um, and is it consistent, the behavior is consistent practices? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's always that this, um, training on these two is always lower than training on one. And does it also translate to actual performance and not just the loss? So for the, so for these, because I was using a pretty small model, it didn't really have very good in context abilities. So I was only measuring the validation loss. For the synthetics, we did measure like the accuracy and it, it was, a, there was a clean translation between the validation loss going down and the accuracy improving. So. I'll show like a table later on about this. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a good stopping point for questions because we'll go over the data selection algorithm and the data selection problem now. So, so to set up our problem, we'll take as input this uh, skill set over the training data, which we call S train, and it has an associated training corpus X train. We also have an evaluation skill set S eval with associated held out validation data um, X eval that we don't train on. We have a budget of N samples and a pre-trained language model F. And our goal is going to be to figure out how to order and select these N examples from X train to perform well on the evaluation skills. 
And so depending on the relationship between the evaluation skills and the training skills, we can adapt our problem for three settings. So in the case where S train and S eval are equal to each other, the goal is just for the model to learn all the skills it's been shown. So this is kind of equivalent to um, this like pre-training setting where it's like, we show all the data and we want the model to learn from all the data. Um, so we call this the continual pre-training setting. And the skills graph we need here is just on S train itself. So here I've shown a bipartite version of it. So with like S train and S eval, as well as the adjacency matrix corresponding to this. So the second setting is when S eval is a subset or just a single element of S train. So here the goal is we only want to learn one target skill or a small handful of target skills given a big set of data we can select from. So this is kind of more of this fine tuning setting or this sort of like distribution matching setting, but we, we're just gonna call it the fine tuning setting. And the skills graph we need here is a subset of the overall skills graph. So we only need um, just like one column of this adjacency matrix or a subset of it. And then lastly, we consider settings where the evaluation set is disjoint from the training skill set. So here the goal is we want to learn over the training skills to do best on these disjoint evaluation skills. So we're just calling this the out of domain setting. And um, this is common when our evaluation skills are like some standard evaluation benchmark that doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh, explicit training data. It might only have just like um, validation and test data. So here the skills graph is a bipartite graph between these two sets of skills and our adjacency matrix uh, reflects that. So, so here are the three settings we do um, and we're going to tackle them all under one approach. So our general approach is going to be to learn this adjacency matrix, just learn the skill graph and then sample according to this skill graph. So to learn the skills graph, um, there are several things we can do. So first we can just use the definition I gave earlier and all the things I was doing earlier was this very brute force way of um, showing that these edges exist. So we take each pair of SI and SJ, we see if the validation loss on SJ is lower when I train on both of them than when I train on just SJ for a fixed amount of steps H. Um, and then we can set the edge weight proportional to how much the loss changes. And um, But the problem is that this approach is pretty expensive because you essentially have to do a lot of training runs. You have to do the number of training runs is quadratic in the uh, number of skills. So there's like K times M. So one relaxation is that we can also consider a linear approximation to this. So instead of um so what we do instead is for each si and sj we just look at if the validation loss on sj is decreasing over time when we train on si so this is not going to be perfect but it does capture this kind of notion of like influence or transfer and we can again set the edge weight to um, proportional to the change in loss so now the algorithm is linear in the number of skills so we just need to do one training run per skill and evaluate on the other skills. We can also further reduce the computational costs by um, changing the number of steps to learn each edge. And we can also do this thing where we learn this skills graph using a smaller model and then apply the skills graph to select data from a larger for a larger model. So once we've learned this skills graph, um, a very straightforward way to sample according to it is to identify all the prerequisite skills of the evaluation skill set and sample uniformly from those. So this is a this is kind of like an intermediate between like random sampling and our final proposed approach, and we call it skill stratified sampling. So this um, the formal definition is here, but basically it's utilizing it is utilizing some aspects of the skills graph. But the drawback is that it doesn't account for the weights of the edges in the skills graph, and it does not exploit the graph dynamically. So what I mean by that is while we're training, um, it makes sense that we want to stop allocating as much data to a skill once its loss is super low. So this idea that, you know, for Lego or addition, like we get a digit perfectly, we should stop like blasting the model with d data from that digit like we should tone it back um so it doesn't make sense to keep the sampling proportion 
um, for the data the same after validation losses, really low on a skill. So for to build out Skillet, we're going to formulate the data selection as an online optimization problem. So we set um, T rounds or T epochs, and at each round we sample N over T points from X train according to the distribution PT over the training skills. So for some notation, we let FT be the model at round T, and we have this sort of dynamics model phi, where we express FT as a function of the model and the sampling distribution at the previous time step or previous round. So FT minus one and PT minus one. We can almost think of this in a very like uh, RL way. So um, the action is the sampling distribution and we get a new model state from that. Then we let this L eval J F of T just be uh, notation for the validation loss of FT on the Jth evaluation skill. And so our objective is now we want to minimize the average validation loss on the evaluation skills at time t by changing the distribution over training skills at each round. So the things we'll want to optimize for are this p1 through pt um, on the k-dimensional simplex. So unfortunately, it's pretty hard to solve this optimization problem without more information about the phi dynamics. So let's try to constrain this a bit by thinking of just about how does the loss of a model FT on skill J depend on the loss at the previous round and the sampling distribution. So we'll do something really simple. So let's assume that S train and S eval are equal, like we can see the J skill in our training data. So a really simple dynamics model is just to say that the validation loss of FT on skill J is going to be equal to the validation loss at the previous step decreased by a factor proportional to how much we sample from SJ. So this is reflecting the heuristic that if we give the language model more training data from skill J, we should expect that the loss goes down on skill J. Um, so it's a it's a simple linear model. Um, not going to say it's perfect, but it's like kind of encoding that intuition. Um, the problem here is that it doesn't account for the skills graph. So our next step is to add that in. So previously, this was our um, dynamics equation. And we have replaced um, that PT minus 1J with this product here. So we've changed this to the Jth column of the adjacency matrix times the vector PT minus 1. So the Jth column of the adjacency matrix is the is containing all the edge weights from the training skills to the Jth evaluation skill. So the interpretation of this dynamics equation is now more training data from either SJ or any of SJ's prerequisite skills should cause the loss on J to go down more. So now we can write out our nicer optimization problem with this new constraint on how um, L eval J evolves over time as a function of this adjacency matrix and of the sampling distribution. And so to solve this, uh, we derive an update rule using online mirror descent in a way that's really similar to um, like the multiplicative weights or hedge algorithm. And um, the update rule is shown here. So we find that we set the proportion for training skill i at time t plus one to be equal to the previous proportion um, multiplied by a factor that's adjusted for the skills graphs adjacency matrix and the current loss of all the skills that SI is a prerequisite for. So basically, if any of the validation losses on the skills that SI is a prerequisite for is high, then we want to sample more of skill I. So assuming we have time, I can walk you guys through a simple toy example of the algorithm just to see, just so you can get some intuition. So let's start with K equals three skills. And we're in the continual pre-training setting where training skills are equal to the eval skills. So we just want to learn all the skills and get all their losses low. Um, and we have this skills graph adjacency matrix. So we have diagonal entries as usual, and we also have an extra edge from S2 to S3. So let's suppose at time zero that all the validation losses are just equal to one. But since skill two is more influential, we already start out by giving a little bit more weight to skill two. So you can see 
P2 here is 0.35 while the other are 0.32. So at the next round, T equals one, let's suppose that skill one's validation loss starts to decrease while the other two stay the same. So as a result, we all allocate less budget for skill one, it goes down to 0.29, and we increase the budget for skills two and three. At the second round, let's suppose that all three skills losses start going down. Um, however, skill three in the blue is not decreasing as much, so we will put more weight on skill three. And since skill two has an edge to skill three, we will also put more weight on skill two as well. Um, and we'll continue to put less weight on skill one, the red one, since it's getting learned quite easily by the model. Now at the third round, let's suppose maybe we put too little weight on skill one and it starts to slow down the learning. Um, and now, but now we've given enough data to skills two and three, so the blue and the orange start going down quickly. And so now we're going to tone back, give a bit more weight to skill one again. And then finally, in the fourth round here, we see that all these three losses are starting to get smaller and approach zero. And so now our sampling algorithm is getting closer to uniform sampling, which makes sense because as everything gets low, you just want to keep everything low and not overfit to one and spike the other one up again. So now I'll go into our results on, yeah. Um, maybe to maybe you, you you might get these in the future in the talk because feel yeah. free to just like ignore. Um, I'm curious about one. What if the validation losses are just at like different scales for different skills, right? Like the lowest validation. What <laughs> would happen in this sampling? Output? Yeah. So in our in some of the things we did, we did this like normalization. So instead of multiplying by just the validation loss, we did like validation loss over the initial one. So we're looking at the relative change um so in the okay yeah I, I guess maybe that makes a bit of sense i don't know like in this we do l eval over like l yeah. eval of f f f zero yeah okay um so then we kind of all start the same but i think it really it's interesting because it really does depend on what what you want like maybe i care about this high high loss skill from the start more and so you can definitely adjust these things um and then the second thing mm -hmm. was you have this constraint that you think loss is always going down or being flat. Mm -hmm. uh, is this always what happens? What happens if validation loss goes up over a cycle? So if it goes up, that's fine because then we'll just see that like, um, so it's fine in the case that it's like, we stopped paying attention to this skill. We're giving too much to other stuff and it starts like unlearning because there's like, K skills, there's a lot of things to attend to. And so then our algorithm will notice this thing goes up and so we'll give it more weight. The one danger here, I guess, is in the case of overfitting. So um, that was not an issue for us because our data sets were like really big um, and we didn't train for really long. So we didn't get into these overfitting issues, but that would be a really bad case because then it's like, I give more training data and it'll it'll increase the validation loss, which is, against our kind of underlying assumption, which is more data equals lower loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the point. I, I was also wondering if you could get trapped in just like a cycle of like, up weight this Yes, thing. yes. Every, every, everyone else's loss goes up, mm -hmm. up weight, though, like just, and it's, yeah. maybe you end up with some weird of them all. Yes, um, we saw that when we made the learning rate really high. So like if we did an ADA of like one, uh, it was pretty bad, so we, it tended to actually be like the ADAs we used in a range of like 0.2 to 0.5 were all pretty good. And it's never like um, like anything where it's like one skill is the majority of the weight tended to get into that sort of cycle because it's, yeah, it just sorts of overfits and forgets things. So the the relative changes in the proportions were actually a bit smaller than we thought. Like it was like for three skills, it was like, what 30 30 percent 30 percent 40 is like the most dramatic and it was just these small um kind of small changes that made a difference so okay yeah, yeah. thanks cool um all right so let's go into some of the results so we'll evaluate skillet which was that update rule there as well as the simpler skill stratified sampling across the three settings so continual pre-training fine-tuning and out of domain 
For the baselines, we compare against the random sampling over the training corpus or just random sampling over the target skill in the case of fine tuning, since that's kind of what the convention is. And we also compare against some curriculum learning baselines. So here we order all the instances according to the pre-trained models lost, and we use this ordering to determine the pool of data to select from at each round. And for most of these experiments, we use the 125 million model, um, but we also explored doing this like small to large model transfer, as well as we did a larger experiment on the 3 billion parameter model. And for our data sets, we considered the Lego and addition synthetics, the natural instructions data set, and uh, the red pajama data set. So in the continual pre-training setting for Lego, we want to learn all of the five skills well. And we find that this uh, purple line here, skillet, reaches lower validation loss more quickly than all the other approaches across all the other skills. And um, so going to the comment about like the downstream performance here, we're measuring the accuracy of skillet by seeing if it predicts um, the value of zero or one val uh, correctly for the desired variable. And so here in the bottom row is skillet's performance. And we can see that across all the skills, we uh, have higher accuracy than all the other approaches. Next, we consider continual pre-training on the natural instructions data set. So we consider a subset of 23 of the task categories because there were a bunch of task categories that didn't have edges to each other or they were a bit sparse. We just got rid of those um, or they didn't have that much data. So we picked some of the bigger ones. And so we have over a million input output pairs to choose from. And we found that skillet and skill stratified sampling on the right um, obtained lower average validation loss for skill than these baselines of random sampling and curriculum learning. So in particular here in this table, we also added two, um, two extra baselines, uh, skill curriculum and skill anti-curriculum. And these are basically ordering the data by the average loss of each skill. So this you can think of as kind of a multitask version of curriculum learning, but multi-skill, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think curriculum here is like even worse than random? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So I think that I think that one thing we played around with was that curriculum learning has a lot more hyperparameters in terms of like this um, mixing rate and like this pacing function. So we did play around with that, but these were the best numbers it was reported. Um, yeah, I, I need to look more carefully at it, but um, yeah, it was not super clear to me why it was happening. So then we can move on to the fine tuning setting. So let's look at some of the synthetics first. So for Lego, we look at skill three being our target evaluation skill. So in the previous section, we discussed how skill two helps with skill three, um, even when we just train on a uniform mixture of them. And so now in the green line, we can show that we do slightly better by just making this mixture dynamic, um, which is, you can might argue it's a little bit more work, but we didn't do any like hyperparameter tuning or anything, just ran it and it works a bit better. Um, for addition, we look at skill one as the target skill. And we previously discussed how skill two helped with skill one. And here we can show that this dynamic mixture uh, does better than skill stratified uniform sampling. So moving on to some real data, let's revisit the Spanish question generation task. So shown on the left is the skills graph we used. And we can see that even though the uniform sampling, which is the orange line, um, already improves over just training on Spanish question generation, uh, we see that Skillet can do even better by fully leveraging the skills graphs edge weights in an online fashion. We show similar results for the stance detection problem, where skillet outperforms our previous uniform sampling between stance detection and text matching, as well as this conventional baseline of just training on the target skill. Finally, we studied the out of domain setting. So here in for the natural instructions case, we use 59 task categories from the training split 
of natural instructions, and then we use 12 task categories from the test split as the evaluation skill set. And these are completely non-overlapping. So on the right is the bipartite skills graph. It's very small, apologies. But um, all you need to know is that there are some of these rows here that are like brightly highlighted, which suggests that they are more feasible prerequisites for the evaluation skills than others. So you squint, you can see um, question answering is one over there, um, question generation, uh, sentiment analysis, text categorization. So there's a few, there's a few rows that are helpful and there's a bunch of them that aren't really. So when we look at the validation loss on each evaluation skill, we can see that Skillet outperforms on 11 out of 12 task categories by random, um, and it outperforms this random sampling from the training data set, as well as skill stratified sampling, which isolates these prerequisite skills, but treats them all equally, which I think is part of the problem why it doesn't do that well. So uh, next we do this larger case study on the red pajama data set. So our training skills here are these data sources. So archive, books, before, um, all of these. And our evaluation skill set is disjoint. We're using the language model evaluation harness to look at a few tasks like full queue, win a grand, and so on. And so we continually pre-train a 3 billion parameter model that's already been trained on 1 trillion tokens. And um, for simplicity here, we just consider like one round of sampling. So we find that Skillet with the data proportions on the left outperforms uniform sampling on the data sources. So one thing to notice about this chart is, first of all, it's accuracy. And um, the accuracy does get slightly worse for Skillet as we continue training. Um, one reason we think for this that I'm trying to fix is that the skills graph we learned was only on the first billion tokens. So we see this improvement in the first billion tokens, but if we keep on using the skills graph, it kind of becomes outdated. And so we kind of need to refresh it and like kind of see what does the current model at time T plus one um, think is its skills graph. So we should do that. We're working on it. Um, Sorry, is this accuracy over the... The eval tasks. Yeah. Yeah, the average like, email. Yeah. Uh, but the performance difference is not great. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that well, it's like a little bit better for at the one billion token level, but uh it definitely kind of uh evens out because we I think we need to uh we definitely need to try more things here. Yeah. Do you think that um uh, also, like relearning the skills graph during fine tuning would also be important. Like, or did you try that out and see if there were changes? Like, after you'd done some mm -hmm. uh, skillet, like, yeah, training, I training it changes the dynamics of the graph. Yeah, I haven't really checked that, but I think it does make sense that you want to do that because you see that, um, like, this graph we're learning is dependent on when we're like cutting off yeah. what defines an edge. So, yeah. if we look at the first x steps there's like a big gap and then eventually they start to close off close and there's no longer this edge so yeah. i think my intuition is that as we continue to train um the graph becomes more and more sparse because you know the last five percent of skill a is going to be very different from what closes the gap for the last five percent of skill b but if both of them are not very good they have overlapping you know concepts that can improve in both so that would be my guess is that it gets more sparse and eventually you just want to train uniformly on the skills to best learn them. But yeah, it's something I'm trying right now. Is it also, uh, can, can you think about it in terms of like if you're relearning the graph at different points, okay. you're sort of also capturing more than the pairwise associations between skills? Because if, if you've been training on more than just the pair. I see. Because because there could be interactions there, right? Like yeah. you need some third skill to yes. unlock the like uh, yeah yeah connection between two skills. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I haven't really thought about that. I think with the skills graph, we could definitely go more complex. Yeah. Look at more, like um, I don't know if you guys know like the taskonomy stuff. Um, it's like in vision. It's a vision paper, but they do. Um, well, they take a bunch like just a fixed set of um, tasks that people use in. Envision and they uh, did like this hypergraph thing. So they did really complex interactions and did like all these different ways to learn these edges. Um, so we could definitely build that out a lot more. Um, 
but it's expensive. So yeah. we're working on, I'm really interested in trying to think about how, how can we make this cheaper while getting as much information out of it as possible. Yeah. And did you have, you were saying something or no, sorry. Oh, I was wondering whether the, like, the difference here is relatively small, but I'm wondering if that's because you're averaging across a really large number of tasks. And it could be that training on GitHub helps if you have some code generation tasks, but for the other tasks, you wouldn't expect it to, to help at all. And so if you, if you split it out by the... Like you're thinking that we train, like if we want to do well on like a code evaluation, we should just train on GitHub or... I guess I'm just wondering if you, like if you split the, the graph by like the, the oh. type of evaluation task, <laughs> you see like bigger um tests than others yeah i think for some of these we saw up to like four or five points difference um and i think we did 10-ish tasks I'll, I'll need to check again but yeah i think um it's it's hard to uh get this yeah it was hard to get this gap like pretty big and we were also comparing against i think the um, the mosaic, like the MPT, which was also kind of in this ballpark, like it was maybe like 0.65, I want to say. So they were all kind of in this area at 3 billion. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think we have time. So um, I can go over some of the results where we learn the skills graph on a smaller model. And we use um, we use it to select the data for a larger model. So here we're going to learn the graph on the 125 million parameter model, and um, use it on a, a 1.3 billion model, a billion parameter model. So we see that on the Lego synthetic skillet with the smaller models skills graph still outperforms skill stratified sampling and random sampling on average and across a majority of the skills. And then um, here are the results for the Spanish question generation setting. So again, we've learned the graph on the smaller model, and these are the results on the larger model. So Skillet does outperform uh, uniform across random seeds, as well as just training on Spanish question generation. And then finally, here are the results on the out of domain setting for natural instructions. So Skillet outperforms the baselines on 10 out of the 12 categories. Um, in the previous figure I showed, it was 11 out of 12, but it's still a pretty good um, uh, consistency and doing better than the previous ones. So I will move on to kind of wrapping things up. So to summarize what we've talked about, we've focused on figuring out how to select data for a language model to have a variety of capabilities. And to do this, we study, um, we study how language models learn from data. And we find that there exist these sets of skills in the data that the model learns best in a particular order. And these orderings can be learned from the data and we utilize them to propose Skillet, our online sampling algorithm. Um, lastly, to raise some discussion points, um, there were several pretty in interesting things we found when um, working towards this paper. And I'm really excited to hear everyone's thoughts here. So, the first thing, which I've already stressed a few times, is that we can generally pick up what the model skills are from these semantic groupings, such as task categories, but skills are not oft always equal to just tasks. They're always just equal to data sources. Um, it's like a model-centric definition. And um, we saw that you know if we tried using data sources or instruction types, this really didn't work for certain data sets, and we just got, you know, uh, empty graph or like complete graph. And so a really interesting question is what exactly is a skill and how do we actually discover it from the data? Um, if we have time, I can go over some preliminary results on like trying to recover skills from data. Uh, the second thing is that the skills graph itself is quite interesting. So again, we found that the skills graph also didn't really match up with our intuition. So in the Lego synthetic, we thought there would be this very nice sequence of um, sequential relationship on the skills, but we didn't see this was to be true. So I think it would be really interesting to do a deeper dive into what causes these dependencies. So like, can we pinpoint what uh, mechanism in the model is um, is explaining this? 
And it's also interesting to think about how we can make the skills graph computation cheaper. Um, and can we do it using like simpler heuristics? So I tried doing some things with like embedding distances or like Wasserstein distance on these sets. So I guess there it's already um, an undirected graph, but it didn't really recover any of, it was really noisy. It didn't really recover any of the relationships, at least in the Lego synthetic. Um, and then finally on the algorithm side, I already touched on this, but the skills graph should be a dynamic concept. Um, it's a function of the current model state. So we need to update it to be used throughout training. And um, it's pretty exciting to think about like how many of these artifacts can we actually learn and update on the fly. So given one training trajectory, like what's, what's the most signal we can get out of understanding how the model learns and what the model has yet to learn. Um, I have five minutes. I, I can take some questions now, I think, and we can go over the skills recovery stuff if we have, if people want to, yeah. Did you check for different models if they recover the same skill graphs on the same kind of set of tasks? So I mainly used um, like same model family, but different model size. We found that the 1.3 billion um, did tend to have to tend to recover like a roughly similar skills graph like the edge weights were slightly different but you could normalize and it would be similar we also did some like across different model sizes yeah across different model sizes but it does it would be really interesting to study like this scaling behavior because obviously what the dependencies are for like a you know 60 billion parameter model are going to be really different for versus what a 125 million model is, yeah. So the bottom of uh, the part of the old one, I expect uh, if different models trying on different, or the same model trying on different data sets, or like different training problems, I would also have. I see, yeah, that would, I think that might change, that would be really different. I think it would really depend on what the pre-training corpus is. So largely, I think this sort of transfer experiment worked because both models were trained on the pile. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming the same, apply application of deduplication and filtering was used there but if we were to do like you know the uh i don't know like the llama model like doing neo to llama that would be potentially really different yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I just want to maybe be a clarification on that transfer from small to large models yeah. are you just creating the graph once and then are you like doing multiple rounds of, of the reweighting the skillet graph there and the data weightings or are you just driving it with the small model and then just training the bigger model using that like one set of weights. Yes, so we learn the skills graph, just like the one skills graph on the small model, and then we deploy it yeah. and select data for the right. large model. So You're not like training the small model at the same No, time. we're not You're training like with, this, with the small model, yeah. Um, and then maybe this slightly unrelated question. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the, not the slide right before this, but the one before that, you have this point about, yeah, why does, Skill two help skill three and four, while skill three doesn't help skill four. Mm -hmm. But if you need skill two to learn skill three mm -hmm. to some great degree, then le learning, discovering that skill three to four edge is going to be really hard. Right? Yeah. Think, yeah. So that's one thing where it's like maybe after conditioned on we're at a model state where we learn skill two, mm -hmm. then maybe skill three would help skill four. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess in this graph, right, like you're this way that you're learning the graph, it's, it's always going to be these like pairwise. Yeah, we're kind of all starting it from one snapshot yeah. and going like that. Yeah, um, versus kind of this sequential thing. Yeah, I, I guess what you're suggesting is a little bit even like curriculum learning, I guess, where like you have just like trained primarily on one thing and then train kind of shift over to another thing. Um, well, I, or, or like also, I guess like, I, yeah, I guess maybe if this, if you could have more than one hop, learn more than mm -hmm. one hop edges, that yeah. might just be more useful for like, even just this data weighting yeah. stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I know there are some papers that are studying these sorts of like multi-hop or like tra transitivity, I guess. So it's like, okay, if skill two helps, I guess it's slightly different, but it's like if skill two helps skill three and skill three helps skill four. Does yeah, there's like two of them. Yeah, things like right, that. Yeah. Um, so those are really interesting and it's it's just pretty complicated because it's all conditioned on what the model currently knows so there's a lot of like uh 
it's it's all yeah it's kind of like this rl problem i guess this really big uh combinatorial space depending on the sequence you take um yeah so on the topic of of the surprising order of the synthetic skills um i i learned a little bit about the field of um competitive mental math last weekend mm -hmm. Fun. um and those guys have methods because the way you have to give the answer you have to start with the big digits first so they have ways of multiplying and adding in in their head that starts that goes left to right instead of right to left mm -hmm. oh wow because, because then they can start giving the answer while they're still working out the later digits in their head <laughs> that's really interesting yeah i think that also reminds me um this like a digit uh this addition synthetic was um studied in some like rocking posts and they also did find that the language model learns the the like the biggest digit first so it also learns left to right um and i'm not sure exactly what the algorithm was but it seemed to be some sort of it wasn't addition it was like some shortcut solution or something like that and i i heard that they tried like changing the order so they just reversed the digits of the addition and it it did better because language models are left to right and all, all this all this very interesting stuff so it's yeah i think it would be cool to connect this sort of like here's our skills graph with here's actually what the model is learning and this is why like skill two influences skill one and not the other way around i think we're at time yeah. the um if folks have questions um Come over for lunch if you're in person or contact info uh, if you're not. But thank you all so much for attending. Yeah, thanks, Paul.